Hello, everyone. This is Health welcoming you to another episode of Music in the Minor League. This week, we are joined by my ex-bandmate and friend, Chad Lyles. We played together for many years in the Grizzly Band and traveled the country together. After that band ended, Chad took some time away from music, but we're going to check in to see if he's got anything new going on. Before we start, we have a few housekeeping items and updates on the band to get out of the way. First off, if you like what you hear, please subscribe to the podcast and tell a friend about it. That's the best way to help us grow our audience. Second, if you like the bands we're talking to or talking about, go follow them on your streaming network of choice and tell others about the music. That really helps with finding new venues to play and reaching new audiences. Third, if you'd be interested in appearing on the podcast, hit us up and let us know. We'd love to talk to you at some point. Finally, we've got some shows coming up. March 11th, we'll be in Webster at Union Tavern with Grifters and Shills, Sean Holcomb, and Matt Woods. That's going to be a good one. On March 25th, we'll be heading up to Nacogdoches for a show at Fredonia Brewing. We're also gearing up for some road dates in April with Grifters and Shills that will bring us through the Hunt Club in Tulsa, Oklahoma on April 13th, the Brick in Kansas City, Missouri on the 14th with Johnny Lawhorde of Pentagram String Band, AMPM Bar in Fayetteville, Arkansas on the 15th, and Frankie's OKC in Oklahoma City on the 16th with Griffin Wade and Rachel. Lynch. Now we're going to kick it off with Memphis Dreams from the Grizzly Band.
thought you thought you'd get out of town But for her, when it rains, if it gets too warm She got up to leave, but he was blocking the door She lay down man we're here with our good friend mr chad lyles aka chad grizzly of the grizzly band also formerly of pride kills houston Mm -hmm. hardcore so we're stoked to have somebody here who's kind of run the gamut got a little more rock and roll going been a minute since the grizzly thing's been going on so what you been up to man well actually i was invited here under the guys that we would be talking about north mythology with the focus on norwegian subculture and dark who did you talk to I guess since you guys want to talk about music, oh, whatever. Um, and, you know, that's very black metal if you're going yes. to the whole north. Um, <laughs> um, I have been doing a whole lot of just being a domesticated animal. That's really all I've been doing. I, that's, there's really, there's nothing more than that. I clean my pool, I put my shoes on, and I work every day take care of my kids and my family. That's what I do. Cool, man. Well, thanks for coming. It was good to talk to you, man. <laughs> <All right>. <laughs> That's the catch up. That's, That's not the there. You know, there's no hidden. We don't have the Chad Lyles project in the work. Uh, you know, I started writing again, you know, good recently. And it, it's, it's a tough process. You know, once you have uh, turned that light switch off and there's no more of the have to or really want to at one point, you know, it becomes a lot less of a priority in in my life so you know I, I spent a lot of time doing more art stuff and not messing by having a bunch of guitars sit in my office and in my studio resenting the shit out of me and collecting dust and you know asking me like why aren't you picking me up you know you used to you used to touch me all the time now suddenly you put me in a corner and this is where we're at you know and there was something that just kind of clipped or maybe collapsed. I guess maybe collapsed is a better way. In my brain that was like, you know what? This uh, this is a thing that you've been doing most of your life and there's no reason to not be doing it right now. And then, and I and so I have been writing again. I don't even know if it's good. I really don't. But I, the fact that I'm doing it at all is for me solidifies the fact that my brain's not completely broken. So that's good, you know, and anybody, no one's ever like, dude, this is good. <laughs> at least at first, and then you got to play it for a while and be like, okay, yeah, 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 yeah. This is I don't good. know. I don't know if you've listened to any of our albums. They were all, they were all good immediately. <laughs> they were. Right off the I bat. mean, for real. Yeah. No. First four seconds of the song, like three chords. That's amazing. <laughs> That was it. It's amazing. <laughs> and then the lap steel came in and just ruined it. Oh, my God. <laughs> Whatever. I mean, Have you got... ever tried to mix a lap steel? Good it is Lord. Hard. It is a it, beast. It'll boost that low end. That's the thing. <laughs> oh, man. Because otherwise, it's like all like needle point. Oh, you're just <laughs> piercing. Yeah, that was a tough. Yeah, that was roll a tough. The highs, role. bring up the lows. That was oh. tough. It really was. It really was. And every song, every hour, it was really tough to make sure that health came through perfectly and was in the right spot in the space of sound as opposed to just being this like wall of sound that he 
actually is. Yeah. You know, I mean, there's so many strings and so many chords overlapping everything that it was it was difficult to like pinpoint the spots that were important and then bury him just enough to like throughout the chorus or you know through the choruses and through the verses when he wasn't playing a lead. Which you know after we lost the lead guitar player, he kind of took that role really quickly and you know because i don't i'm a rhythm guitar player and i'm terrible at that you know anybody in the band would tell you that i'm i'm i have no rhythm at all you know but he came in and filled those spots but in recording man it was tough it was it was tough to get him to blend without having to overproduce and have two extra guitars laid over just to kind of like thicken it up you know it was was a tough it was a tough tough go at on recording i bring a lot to the table okay you do. You did. Absolutely. <laughs> Especially once you got that organ oh, uh, man, pedal. Yeah. That was amazing. That, that was, added so much depth. Yeah, that was fun. It was either that or I was going to make you start playing keys. So Yeah, and I was not going to learn another <laughs> instrument. I'm done with that. I've learned yeah. enough. I do, yeah, right. My brain is done. Like This is the end of it. After this, I'll get a harmonica maybe. <laughs> I doubt it. Blues travelers, huh? You gonna, is that, you, is that, you is that a package satchel? joke? I think like there's a package joke in there. Are you, no, are you going to have a satchel? Like, you know, you mean like a gun a holster? Chub- well, like, kind of like guns? how Chewbacca has, but it's like right across the front, but it's just harmonicas. I'm totally down with that. John Popper, if mm-hmm. you'd like to hang out, let me know. <laughs> Tell me about it. <laughs> right. This is going to be a long night. It might be. So as someone who's really close to Chad, one thing he hasn't talked about what he did with his time is... He got into like sleight of hand magic, and mm. like I'll never forget, he like texts me, he's like, "Yeah, I, I'm I'm doing this sleight of hand magic thing. I didn't want to tell you because I was afraid you were gonna make fun of me." And I'm like, "Man, am I that much of a jerk that one of my best <laughs> friends is like I can't tell you my hidden talents because you're just gonna berate me, dude? He's really good at it, like, and like I show it to my friends or other friends, and they're just like." You know that guy? That's amazing. I'm like, yeah. But he wouldn't even tell me this. And so it's like, maybe I am the jerk. It's just, I just don't believe you on anything. That's kind of our deal with health. It's like, there's so much stuff that it's like, he'll tell you. It's and then tough. forget that he told it to you. I lived with the guy for 15 years. I know, basically. Oh, yeah. man. Oh, man. <laughs> oh, my God. Like when John came over that time, you're like, dude, he's, he's vegan, like pretty hardcore. Like, make sure... <sighs> You know, we already ordered pizza and stuff. It's like, oh, dude, I don't know what to do. And Kim ended up like making a salad or something. And then he comes in, he's like straight edge and all this. Like a dude who was going to play drums with us. And he's like, first thing he does is grab like the all meat pizza. Can I have a beer? <laughs> And Health had forgotten he had told us this earlier in the week. He was like, what? Why are you looking at me? It's like, man. He did the same thing to me. Whenever we whenever we got Dan on as our, he started out as our photographer. And he told me, he goes, hey, he's just so you know, he's like, my, my buddy Dan, the photographer guy, he's like, he's got a lazy eye. Oh. And he goes, he always wears sunglasses. He's like, but don't say anything about his eye. Don't make like a big deal out of it, you know? And like, this was a big buildup. And like, we're he's going on tour with us in the van. You know, we hadn't met him yet. And he had his sunglasses on the entire time we were loading up getting on the road and everything like that and he finally takes the sunglasses off and i was like health he doesn't have a fucking lazy eye and health was like what are you talking about and i was like you said dan had a lazy eye (laughs) and dan's like what are you talking about (laughs) like it was the weirdest most awkward moment but it was it was a solid he was a solid jab he got us yeah, health does that a lot. Don't trust health. It's a long con, okay? <laughs> it's a, you gotta, you gotta dig re- in. You gotta, you gotta like make notes and remember what you tell people because it, it, you probably could have gone a lot deeper with it, but you're like, what are you talking about? Because I didn't want to say anything, but you're getting older and you keep forgetting things. <laughs> it's, it's what it really is. So how did this quickly become the health podcast? Well, right? you, we'll said you, back back around <laughs> Chad, but you said you thought it was you. We just wanted to make sure that you knew it, it was is you. Me, but yeah. even like yeah. on tour, we were going on tour this summer. He's like, oh man, one of my students has this thing in New York. Like I might be able to do the first like four days. Days. And like he's got me looking up flights, like who flies into like Kearney, Nebraska. So we can fly him out. It's like, are we gonna have to go? Are we gonna have to drive like all the way to Omaha oh to get my him? God. Like, yeah. how are we gonna do this? Yeah. And then like I'm sending fly information. He's just like, oh, dude, no, I was just joking. Student yeah, made that's this that's some definitely classic health. But he had a student who had done it years before, and he made sure it was the you know I looked the event <laughs> up because I didn't believe him. So I looked because the event up, like him. it is that day. You like, should oh, you dude. should always be that way with yeah. him. For sure. We're skeptical. Always yeah. double check. Keep you on your toes, man. That's, <laughs> that's how I like to live my life. You know? All right. Now we broke we broke the ice. <laughs> We're all here. We're all made fun of hell. Oh, we man. talked about our betrayals. Right. Brought those out on the table. Mm-hmm. Oh, wait. Let's talk about another thing Chad got into. Over the, and this is true. He got into making artistic dioramas. I guess it's miniature dioramas. Mm-hmm. Have you seen these things? No. You need, like, again, <laughs> Chad, Chad was like, I didn't know if you were going to make fun of me. 
I'm like, that's why he doesn't tell me stuff. I'm like, why are we friends if you can't trust me? Well, let me let me put it this way. So when when music kind of is like left my body, and that's the only way I can really describe it. It did. It, it was one day I was in it, and everything was about it, and then one day it was like it's gone for a while. I had to fill the gap somehow. So I picked up every nerdy thing that I could possibly even imagine in my head to fill that gap that was time consuming that was tedious that was that would that would make my brain you know for lack of a better way to put it tingle because that's what i needed and you know i've been an artist for years and years and years yeah. like as far as like you know i could i can draw you know i mean like i get it naturally my parents my grandparents everybody can draw they're all amazing artists and this that and the other and i'm a human printer and that's just all there is to it but i never really t- appreciated it so i wanted to try something different now the the magic thing now that you've made me feel really awkward about this. Don't feel awkward about it. Embrace it, it dude. It, it's something that I've been fascinated with since I was, you know, like any little kid, you know. And I've always dabbled in it. And I've always, like, messed around with sleight of hand and, you know, card tricks and coin tricks and stuff like that. But I never showed anybody. And every once in a while, I'll show a friend, you know, like when I really get something down really nice. I'm like, hey, check this slide out. You can't even tell what I'm doing, you know, like whatever. And I'll send a little, you know. 30 second clip of me playing with some cards or something like that. I do collect cards, by the way. That that is that is another thing that's it's a little embarrassing. Like I have entirely too many decks of cards. Like I I mean, I don't even know how many. I've probably spent uh, probably anywhere from fifteen hundred to two thousand dollars on cards in the last couple of years. Oh, so wow. don't yeah. worry, we'll edit this part out so Becky doesn't know. Oh no, she knows. She sees it. <laughs> she knows exactly I mean, you walk into my office and it's like cards and horror you know what i mean so but yeah so i i got into a lot of very i say nerdy things and i you know i think nerd means something completely different now than what it did when i was a kid you can now a nerd is like you nerd out with your thing yeah. like whether it's music whether it's you know card magic whether it's comic books whatever it is you nerd out with it but it doesn't make you quote unquote that nerd like it used to mean when we were kids where you're you're the dork that nobody likes it means that you are really into something you are yeah. you are focused hyper focused on a thing and um and it's it's one of my things i hyper focus on things and i i get really into them and then like halfway through it i'm like meh I'll try something different, you know. So I <laughs> have tons of these crazy little hobbies. But now that music's come back, it's now it's balancing all those little things. You know, like now where do I where can I find the real estate to put music back in? You know, and, and yeah. so I'm trying trying to kind of balance out like my love and passions that I've found that I never had because I soaked it all up with music. Music really kind of just was this huge blanket that was like, we're just gonna sit on top of you and the world's gonna kind of disappear because it's gonna be over your head. And now I've finally peeked out underneath that cover. I'm like, there's a lot of stuff out here that I didn't do because I was on the road, because I was constantly grinding, you know, because I was constantly in the studio, I was constantly trying to write and make lyrics and make music, you know, and it, and I won't say it was a bad thing. I mean, obviously, it was my whole life, you know, yeah. I mean, but being able to experience other things outside of that has really kind of brought me back around to like, okay, now I have, I have other interests now and I can kind of get back to what my passion really was. And it's, I mean, it's always been music. I mean, music has been my thing since I was a little kid, you know, I've been playing music for my whole life, you know? So, so you feel like you found some balance when you stopped cold Turkey? I, well, I don't know if I found balance when I found, when I stopped cold Turkey, I did not find balance. I fell off a cliff and it was, it was a cold, hard fall. And it's been that way for a while until I started finding other ways to make it actually feel balanced at that point. But you know, it, without music man like it, it life is a little gray absolutely you know it's it's this this mundane kind of like you get to the plateau of a day and it's just that way until you go to sleep and then you do it again you know there's no shows i have to worry about which is you know it's good for my psyche it's good for my anxiety you know not having to worry about shows and booking tours and balancing checkbooks and making sure all f- of these jerks are happy and you know after a while i was like i'm tired of trying to do it all i just i think after a while you get away from the music it becomes mm-hmm. like the business aspect of mm-hmm. it which kind of adds to all the drama yeah you know we're doing the day we're in booking in a tour in april and it's been i've been having to keep a track of my blood pressure mm-hmm. and i'll go in there and be like 117 over like 75 i'll go do a few booking emails strap it on it's like 138 <laughs> over like 91 i'm like that's what it does to be like instantly it's like yeah jittery it's a lot of stuff that just pulls away from the actual just creating sure 
Well, I, I think, I think, I think that when you're, when you're, especially like when you're booking and stuff like that, like it is that whole, like, are they going to like me? Are they, you know, did, did they like us last time we played in that place? Do they want us to come back? It is that whole, like, it's like, it's am like, I worth the guarantee that I'm asking for? It? That, yeah. That was a tough one. You know, it, it, when I get there, I've asked for this, even at the minimum, our $50, $100 guarantee anywhere, you know, that we went. Am I going to bring enough people on a Tuesday night to make that $100 worth it? I can drink that much. The whole <laughs> band can drink the amount of money to pay it back and we're paying ourselves except for health health doesn't drink didn't drink it's the only reason why he drove like a maniac <laughs> <laughs> but oh so i'm not the only one that thinks no. he drives like a maniac right, <laughs> you <good>. are not <laughs> <laughs> Total maniac. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, you know, the the anxiety is always there for me. You know, it was always there. It was is are my bandmates going to be sober enough to to make it happen? And I'm not talking shit about anybody. It was any of us. You know, except yeah. for health, of course. Health was always on point. He was always pretty much the like given MVP of every show. The dead mother of the band. Yeah, you know. But it was whether we're going to perform correctly. I mean, even if we were stone sober, I mean, there's always you know, you, there's always that like tinge of I, I guess fear that. that that someone's going to screw up just enough yeah, and it's going to th- be this like trickle down effect and the whole song's going to fall apart and then we're going to look like assholes on stage. And it, and that was all the time, you know, and then me being up front who just not a front man, never been, never wanted to be, just ended up being the guy that stood up there because nobody else would. Having to like take the brunt of that when something went wrong behind me, it was me just facing it and just taking it. And even if it was my fault, I still had to do it. Yeah. And I, nine times out of ten, I wouldn't remember lyrics. I'd fuck up a you know a, a a riff, or I'd miss a line, or I'd skip an entire chorus. You know, like I've done it. I've done oh, it all. Yeah. And and that it, that's tough. You know, I mean, like that kind of anxiety sucked for me. But it was it, honestly, and and this is kind of root of where the cold turkey came from was was when my mother passed. And when my mother passed, I really just like the winds were just taken right out of my sails, and I just had. Yeah. no nothing i had no want anything and i got on some antidepressants and you know uh anti-anxiety medication and i don't and i don't know what it did to me but it all but erased my want to play music and now that i've changed medication it's obvious that whatever my stresses were were rooted in the lifestyle that i had created at that point yeah. you know mm-hmm. and it, it's a tough gig man it, it takes a special kind of person to, to do it all the time and just let it roll off your shoulders and not be completely destroyed at the end of every night you know what i mean whether it was a good or bad show you know so it's funny that like we talked to charles last week that's one of the things he talked about was like the crash after he mm-hmm. played like the next morning like he's like depressed like oh i did i should have talked so much and at the same time you're like takes a point where you're like well you know i've been in the audience for shows it's like it wasn't i always try to put myself in like when i did something i did like i didn't i don't get angry at me Mm -hmm. the person in my role like if somebody skips a piece or does something you know it's like cool man it's the more human aspect of it but when it's you who does it you're like oh terrible everyone hated me yeah, I mean it's it's a tough it's a tough thing. Yeah. Like my one of my biggest fears was either throwing up on stage or losing my voice on stage, which I've never thrown up on stage, thank goodness. But I did lose my voice a handful of times and it and it was it was terrifying. I don't I don't know why it was so terrifying and I remember a specific moment that I felt like I needed to tell everybody constantly during the show that I had lost my voice. And it was, it was so embarrassing. Even every time I said it that like the next day I was like, why did I have to say it so many times? Like, why did I have to keep reminding? Obviously I have no voice. You know, I'm like, like squealing into a mic. I, I like, I just had like seasonal allergies and it gave me laryngitis. I, I was, I've been at shows where you said that it was like, chat sounds fine. <laughs> it's like but oh it's like my voice sorry it's just not there tonight it's like you sound fine <laughs> <laughs> sounds usually raspy the, like always well so. usually the guitars everything were so much so live much louder, that it was yeah. like the vocals were there but there wasn't like there was every syllable <laughs> there <laughs> did he kind of you know yeah, you know you're hyper aware of your own situation i mean that's just how and that, and that and when you're standing on stage and you're hyper aware of everything that's going on around you and then you're trying to concentrate on the next line alone i don't know it was a lot you know and it and it, and it got to me to the point to where i i had a hard time towards the end even committing to shows after i booked them and we got to the point to where i would have to just be like i'm not feeling good i don't feel good i don't feel good about this i can't make it you know and we had to cancel a few shows and it, and it that's also a big 
you know, ego kick. And, you know, it feels bad because I'm letting my guys down. I'm letting the other band that we brought in down, you know, because we booked the show and now they're playing by themselves in a completely strange place and there's nobody there because we bailed on the show you know what i mean and that that was it was bad you know it was bad i was it was a real dark area for me you know but you know there was a, a ton of good times in the band ton. yeah there were some good there times. were good times this, <laughs> well, this no, we're just talking about i feel like yeah. i'm just talking about like where it all ended but yeah. you know the beginnings yeah it's all f- it's all oh yeah I mean, even with that man like it's, it's a lot to go through man mm-hmm. you know a lot of music is a lot of the songwriting's working through all of that. Yeah. You know, so if you're not, you have to take the bad with the good because you don't get the piece of music or the lyrics without having to go through yeah. some of these dark moments. Yeah. But it is, it's kind of like the, it's like, is like the ultimate sin of a musician. It's like we canceled. Yeah. It, so it really is. You have to do that. It's just like, oh, I suck. Yeah. I mean, up to that point, we had almost never canceled. Like, I don't think we had ever canceled Sans some extenuating circumstance right. I, like when the the van broke down was one of the first times that we mm. were like and then by the time it was like it wasn't the van had broke down like the caliper was screwed up on the yeah the, the caliper front. locked up yeah, on the, the brake on the, caliper on the, had, yeah. broke, had, had was screwed up we were supposed to play a festival in Dallas yeah and I was like there's no way we're gonna make this and I was like there's no way we can reroute five vehicles to get all of our gear there and then all of us basically eating it to go to Dallas for this you know knowing full well that the festival was probably going to be a piece of crap anyway which i don't really i don't really like adhere to that whole thing like a show's a show but i we kind of knew it was kind of going to be a bust anyway and it it, it did kind of helped our decision to cancel and we were far enough away that it was easy enough for us to be like man no big deal you know if we were if it was in town there would have been no excuse but that one was but i just remember that being one of the first ones like we've never canceled yeah and the only other one was the particle when particles collide and Brightwire, mm-hmm. and that was at rudyard's and i'll carry and, that show you and, know? Well, and and ian ian barker sam's son mm-hmm. will never let us live that down still angry he is still angry to this day because <laughs> the one time he was finally to see the grizzly band live mm. we bailed yeah that's that's not good <laughs> i mean but he and did. see that's that's the thing is that you know they're you know not to say that we were so freaking cool that everybody was like oh man they didn't show up i'm I'm bummed it's just the thought that people could feel like that you you let a child down i let people down (laughs) you know i let myself down you know i mean it it was look it was a dark time but again there was so many more awesome times in the leading up to that right true well that's the thing i always tell people man like you know i spent years doing concert photography i've seen everybody you know tons of people and y'all are the one local band that can really say that like when y'all hit the stage to start like it's you could close your eyes and you could be in a stadium Hmm. Like the sound was tight. Like y'all did everything right. Like I don't even know how y'all did it. I mean, like even like the t- like the Trust tone me, knobs yeah. were set where everything you could hear everything, <laughs> and there was no point where it wasn't together. Well, that's discussion. That is sitting in a, a studio and actually knowing your own gear. Because you know, it, Matt, the one thing that he said at one point in time, he's like, if you don't know your gear, what the hell are you doing here? He was like, if you if you like you look at your amp. And you don't know what you're... I mean, for me, my tone was like on. Like it was just everything was up and like, you know, it wasn't until years later that I started kind of like, oh, okay, well this this knob does it. Okay. And I can turn, I can actually turn down and get a little bit better. T- wow. And you know, like I was just, I was always full blast. You know yeah. I mean? Like that's, that's how it always was for me. And then when he kind of said that, I was like, yeah, that's good. But everybody else around me was always like, y'all are all the players, man. I'm just the clown in the middle that's like, just turn my stuff on and go. You know, like I have to call Matt and be like, so should I put the, should I put the tuner in front of the tremolo or should I put it behind i don't know where it goes you know what why is my tuner bouncing back and forth i got the tuner in the front so like I'm not, <laughs> so <laughs> if it's a boss when you always put it in front always it's a buffer. It in front. i know but it was things i didn't know because i was always so i was direct you know what i mean like i it was i mean i played hardcore i played punk rock I, it was always yeah. on and loud yeah. like you know there's turn everything loud turn everything up and, you know okay so let's take it back let's take it back to punk and hardcore mm-hmm. you when did you start playing in, in bands so when music took hold and actually got gained real real estate in my head. I was probably 15 and I that was it that was at that point that I started listening to music for the sole purpose of being able to either replicate it or emulate it. And I it wasn't until I was probably 17 that I actually met enough people that had the same 
I wouldn't even say skill level because I had already started, I had already been playing music in orchestra and I played bass and, you know, like, but I'd never really played with anybody and found some people and it was like this pop punk band called Hypertonic in high schools. What a great name. Oh, it was, it was just, you know, it was wonderful. It really was. It was actually a lot of fun. A lot, the lead singer and the songwriter, Kevin, he was such a fun dude, always super bubbly. He's like a plastic surgeon now. It's really weird. In the Caribbean <laughs> of all places. But anyway, he, he always made Made these super fun like pop punk songs you know and i was like the talented bass guy you know like i did all the crazy like matt you know freeman yeah. style licks yes. you know like he we did was like kind of half punk half ska you know a little bit of yeah you know a little bit of everything and you know so i got really proficient at playing bass that way and it was my first experience of like you know doing live shows and doing but i'm standing in the back it was it was easy I had the easiest job in the whole thing. I knew my job. You know, my drummer, he couldn't keep, you know, time for nothing. You know what I mean? But I knew my job and I didn't have to worry about anybody else. I didn't think about anybody else. And I never understood why Kevin was always mad at everybody, you know? <laughs> and I was like, I'm doing my part. And he's like, it's not you, man. <laughs> well, I know, but like, you're always mad at us. Like, why are you mad? But then that, like I said, that that launch, that kind of was a springboard into, and, and the thing about it was I didn't even listen to pop punk at all. I didn't listen to Scott. I didn't listen to any of that. I just, all I did was like, I wanted to play bass. I wanted to play it fast. And I wanted to play like, you know, clicky little, you know, six, eight, you know, like in the back here, my refrigerator and like, you know, and I want to make it sound like MXPX or something, you know, whatever that yeah. noise was. Ding, that, ding, ding, that, ding. that very, very, you know, springy definitive. Fender. Yeah, spring, yeah. But I was, I was really heavy into hardcore and that was, you know, that was my thing. It's like hardcore and punk, like, you know, everything from minor threat to sick of it all and, you know, it, all the good stuff. And that's really what I wanted to do. And that was the first time, once I got out of that, shortly after that, I found a guy who had never played an instrument and taught him how to play bass and guitar. And I was like, okay, we're going to do this. And then I found this little kid, Tracy, who was just a spaz. Like, he really was. He was ADHD, just bouncing all over the place, always in fights, you know, rough and tumble. Never heard hardcore punk rock in his life and he heard it and he was like this is my life I'm gonna gauge my ears out to seven inches in high school in 1995 you know what I mean like the, the, <laughs> like he, he became that guy yeah and he he really embodied what you know what the hardcore scene was at that point and he just happened to have a really cool voice on top of it so he became our like little bouncing flea singer and then my uh ex-wife she was the only person i knew that had rhythm and we i had purchased a drum kit when i was like 13 or 14 and i we used my old drum kit and she beat the hell out of some drums and we had a band we were called one common bond and it was the first like actual like moving around the state you know like regional touring that we, that i had ever done and then it went from there it was like a few years that i probably till i wasn't in my like early 20s and like like right around 22 or so when I started Pride Kills. And that just started with, I was working at United Space Alliance, you know, just a normal job. And a buddy of mine, Gilbert Lira, he's been in a ton of bands. Great guy. He, great bass player, too. And uh, he was working in one of the labs down the way. And I, we were out on a smoke break out behind work. And I was like, we were talking about music and stuff. And he was like, man, we should, we should start a band. I was like, okay, whatever, man. Like, we're adults. We don't start bands as, as adults. <laughs> right. So as adults, you started being like, we're going to play cover songs. <laughs> yeah, you know. And so I, he, goes, he goes, well, do you have any music? And I was like, no. I went home for lunch that day and wrote like four songs. Nice. And I had him over the next couple of days and we fleshed those songs out. And we, it was just us two. And then we somehow, I don't even know how we found everybody else. I, it was Craigslist or Houston. What was it? The Houston uh, bulletin board. What was it called? It was Space City. Oh, yeah, Space, oh, Space City Rock. Yeah, Space City yeah. Rock. Yeah. And so we found a few guys to come in and try out for drumming. And we found a couple dudes. And one of them stuck for a while. He left. We found another guy. And then we it, then it just, the rest is really honestly history. It, it, it kind of fell together. And then it kind of fell apart. And then it, it became. And it, like Pride Kills became an entity in and of itself far beyond whenever I left and it they did their own thing. We had a reunion thing about three years ago and they were like, we want everybody who's ever been in the band to play, you know, their versions or their portion of, you know, the writing and things like that in the beginning. So I basically went and played guitar on the first album that they put out, which again was after I left. 
I got kicked out of my own band, <laughs> you know, but I, you know, I was busy, man. Like I was going to college. I had a kid, you know, and I, between my military stuff, cause I was doing weekends and this, that, and the other, like I had a lot going on. So I had to kind of bail, you know what I mean? And I kind of, I feel like I left them kind of hanging and you know, they moved on. They, they were like, well, you know, you're just, just a guitar player. We can get someone to fill in. And I'm like, oh, that's fine. You know, no big deal. So, but they went on and did really great things to, I mean, honestly, better than almost any band that I've ever been in. You know, yeah, I just remember seeing them with like Will to Live and stuff back yeah. in the day, but I couldn't. I don't know if that was pre. They've, they've done some. They've done some good stuff. Yeah, I pl- I can tell you this. I only played with Will to Live before they were Will to Live, so okay. they were they were scarred for life at that time. Okay, yeah. so that's that's how far back that was. I was only there from two thousand one to right at the beginning of two thousand two. So well. I started in 2000, and then 2002 was when I left, and they went on. That's what it had to have been during that period, because that was like right after Ian was born. So it's possible. I mean, June 2000 esque. Yeah. yeah, it's possible. But if this guy don't remember any of it, like don't remember any of it. <laughs> Did you take a little bit of a break after Pride Kills? From there, yes, because shortly, well, about 2004. Columbia, the space shuttle crashed. And that's when I was working for NASA. And I got laid off. And I kind of like floundered. That's the best way I can put it. Like for life. Like I just didn't even know what to do. I lost like my marriage broke up. I lost my apartment. I, you know, everything was just kind of falling apart. And I'm literally sitting in front of the the Dietrich's coffee on on Montrose. And I have a cup of coffee, which I purchased with my own money. <laughs> <laughs> I was literally people were dropping their coins into my very nice fresh cup of coffee because I just looked disheveled and like a hobo, you know. And I mean, it was it was irritating, but nonetheless, <laughs> I had a, that someone came up and was like, "Hey, Chad, I haven't seen you in a while." And so back to the guy from Pride or uh, from One Common Bond that I taught how to play bass and guitar. It was him. And he goes, man, you still playing music? And I was like, well, I haven't played in a while. You know, Pride Kills a few years ago and this, that, and the other. And he's like, well, man, he's like, what are you doing in a couple of weeks? And I was like, what do you mean? He's like, well, I need a bass player and we're going on tour with my band Phantom Pains. And I was like, okay. And he was like, you interested in playing? And I was like, okay. He was like, well, you got two weeks to learn the songs. And I was like, okay, where's the practice space? Oh, it's my living room. So I had to learn like 19 songs oh, wow. <laughs> that all were not more than... 35 seconds to maybe a minute and a half and all at about 180 BPM. Like, nice. so, and I, I had no gear. Like I was like borrowing my girlfriend's Sears bass with a, you know, like a gorilla <laughs> amp. That's all I had. Like, I swear that's all I was practicing with. Luckily we had some friends, like they were friends with like integrity and like a bunch of big bands in Cleveland and, you know, New York and things like that. And uh, I was, I toured with them for a few years. Nothing really bad happened there. I just was like, I'm just not into this music and I just don't want to. I mean, it was basically Misfits on crack is all it was. It, okay. I mean, it was it was the same, like, imagine Misfits on crack and with, <laughs> yeah, and like, squealy vocals. But I say, It's not like you're doing grind court. It was, it, it, was it, no, it was, it was very straightforward. Like, it, it, I mean, it was about as straightforward punk rock as you're going to get. It was really fast, a lot of hair and a lot of makeup. And, you know, it, it was fun. It was great. I think when we were in an issue of Fangoria, and they had done this <laughs> done this write up on us and they were like, you know, Phantom Pains. They were like, it what was it? It was like is if you've got if you've got they, they 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 pack 19 songs into 12 minutes is what they said. And so on the album, that's exactly what it was. It was 19 songs in 12 minutes. And we would tour on 12 minutes. Like that wow. like that's how it was. I mean, we go in, I mean, like at the end of every show, it was just all you could hear was <sighs> That was yeah. it because we were all so tired after like, I mean, because we had no segues it, I, or every song was segued. Like it was just yeah. bang, 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 back to back to back. It was basically like one long song. Yes. Yes. It, it was, it was intense, you know, but I'm telling you whatever they did, they were a bunch of pretty boys. I'm not going to lie. Like all of them were real good looking dudes. And Daryl, who was the guy that I was telling you, I, I taught him how to play bass. Right? Rather, I, I won't say I taught him. I put the bass in his hands and it worked out. And then he learned how to play guitar. And he was a damn good singer and a damn good writer. He just ex- extremely talented guy. He just didn't know it until he was like almost 20 years old. So, yeah. <laughs> But yeah, Daryl is a, is a very, very striking man. He's extremely good looking. And so he, and he had 
charisma like nobody i've ever seen and he would just get out there and he would just the way he would i mean he he danzigged it you know he'd get into it you know he'd have his his hip movements i don't know it, it dude ruled and i was just a guy who played bass like i i never really felt like i was part of the band but i was a guy who played the bass but man they they had a hell of a draw like we would play though we did this uh halloween show in cleveland ohio at pirate's cove and uh, we play with this band called American Werewolves, and the show was, for the most part, like, at capacity. But it was, like, it was around Halloween, so it was, you know, it was to be expected. You know? We got invited to this house party afterwards, which turned out was Mike Tyson's old mansion, which was owned by Billy Blanks of Tybo. Yes! Well, his kids lived there. He was in prison. Mom was off in the Hamptons in their house. And we were invited to this party that they wanted us to play this show at. And I mean, you, like I'm telling you, it was as big as like Baybrook Mall. Like this place was huge, like wings and stuff, like huge wings of the house. And you walk in, there's a Jaguar in the front foyer and a huge grand piano and some doucher who's playing fucking Queen, which I love Queen. But he was that guy that night, like just playing queen on, on this grand piano hmm. up in the top they had like there was like it was almost like this uh like how the white house has the the columns at the top you know and the, the dome and it, it was a window in each one of them and they had like you know like these mannequins it was like you know michael myers and jason Voorhees, and like they were all it was it was fucking cool man it was really <laughs> it really was it was like i love this place like I, I fell in love with this place they had, i mean they had a pool that had jet skis and it was crazy like it was just crazy and it was an 18 year old and a 15 year old that lived there that was it and then the, the help like that was it it was the only two people that lived there and it was just the wildest shit I've ever seen in my life I knew that I was going to be like wandering around that place and just find Billy Blanks like chained into a you know like by the ankle in a closet somewhere <laughs> you know but uh, it, it, that was that was probably one of the more wild things that I did with them um, outside for the of the fact that I fell asleep on the way back from Arizona one time after a show and I had a fever and I was behind the back seat and they thought they left me but didn't realize they didn't leave me until they were 11 hours away because I was just sleeping behind the seat and they were like I think we forgot Chad and I was like where the fuck are we dude we're like 11 hours and you just realized that you might have forgot me it's you're lucky I'm in the van like, <laughs> because some of y'all would be in trouble like I beat y'all's asses if y'all had left me and didn't figure it out for 11 hours you know so uh, we have a friend of ours, Aaron, that had a great story. They were on tour, and they were all asleep in the back of the van. So, dude, he was driving, pulled into a rest stop to go to the bathroom. Aaron woke up, got up, went into the bathroom, and the driver came out, got back in the van, and drove just off. Burned. It was like everyone's still asleep in the back. I'm good. <laughs> Aaron walks out just like, <laughs> where did everyone go? Yep. <clears throat> See, and this is why we tour in a Kia Soul. Can't leave anybody if you're in a Kia Soul. Right. You know, you know where everyone's at. <laughs> it uh, works. But then I think that same band just blew up with the What Up Denny's video. So so Aaron's the bass player of that band. Nice. And he got left in some, I think it was in Ohio. <laughs> so All right, so you, Phantom Pains? Yeah. So after Phantom Pains, I took a pretty large break because at this point I was like in a transition pretty largely in my musical style, in my musical taste. And I, I am old enough now to admit that I listened to It's Morning, I'm Wide Awake by Bright Eyes, and it changed my effing life. And I'm not even kidding, because I was like, wow, I can play pseudo country and acoustic stuff and still be cool and still say important things? I had no idea. Yeah. And so I really focused on learning how to play a guitar. Like, I, I literally went to the guitar shop and bought one of those, like, chord progressions sheets you know because i was like I, I don't know how to do this i was like reinventing the wheel like trying to learn how to play a guitar and i was like i need this is you know before internet was readily available all the time you know it was probably 2000 when i say i mean it was readily available i just didn't because i was poor you know it was probably 2000 it was probably about 2005 because i had moved to austin just before i moved to portland and so i moved to austin and i decided i was like i'm gonna be a solo artist I'm gonna sing sad songs and wear pink shoes, you know, like, <laughs> and I, I did. I was like, you know, this is what girls like, right? You know, I had no idea. I'm gonna have emo hair and I'm gonna sing sad songs with my guitar and, you know, do it that way. I played one show, one show, and it was so mortifying. Like, it's not that I sucked. Well, 
I sucked. <laughs> but it was just, it was an open mic. And I had never done anything like that. I'd never done an open mic. And I was so terrified. I was so, I just felt, I was so uncomfortable. I couldn't, I came and I, I hate even thinking about it. And so I kind of like gave up on that. And then I moved to Portland and I met some dudes and I mean, they were dudes. They were like the dudest dudes I've ever met in my life. They were <laughs> pot smoking surfers from Wisconsin. And yeah, the surfer part is what gets me too. Yeah, me too. Um, yeah. But they were all they were all surfers. But they had this. They found me on Craigslist. They had a great spot that was located about six doors down from. Was that damn band? Um, not the Shins. The other one that uh, band band not Band of Horses. Is it Band of Horses? Is that what the name of that band is? There's a band called Band of Horses. I think that's the one. Anyway, it's right down the down the hallway. But it was a great studio, and they played like this. I really can't even define what they played. All I did was they wanted me to play guitar, and I played very bad guitar, and I just made stuff as I went, and I I really got heavy into noise music at that point. Like, and that's really what it came down to. It was like noise, math, rocky kind of like screamy stuff, and that lasted maybe maybe about a year. We did some minor touring regionally, nothing major, nothing really ever came of it, but it was fun, and I made some great friends, and it was an interesting time. But then once I got back here, I got real bored. Real quick and I needed to I needed to do something and that was when I decided in October to get a Facebook October of 2008 ish I got a Facebook and then I put on Craigslist that I was looking for a band that liked to do things like Towns Van Sant and Johnny Cash which I had no idea how to do any of that like not a clue and three dudes hit me back or one dude it was Rick Bratcher the original original drummer he hit me back and he's like, hey, man, it's a little three piece. We do like, country covers just for fun. Nothing serious. But we're trying to get a, a songwriter in here. And I was like, oh, I'm totally that guy. I'm the songwriter. And he's like, all right, well, let's meet up next weekend, you know, or next Wednesday. And uh, let's see, see what you got, man. I'm like, cool. I wrote a song on the way to Francisco's to meet up with him that Wednesday. I did nothing <laughs> in the interim. <laughs> On the way there, I was like, I'm like literally like, like writing lyrics while I'm driving. And I like half-assed the letter was the first song that i wrote and i had three chords i was like i know three chords and i played three chords and i could not keep it in time i just kind of sang around because i had never practiced it but they saw something in it that that they liked they were like like rick was like look man just just stop doing what you're doing and let us square the music out for you once you get the music squared out then you can work on like singing and playing i've never really worked on singing and playing with anybody because I the only time I sing and played or sung and played was by myself and so that's that's no timekeeping there right yeah you know, like you just play what it, you play around your lyrics you know you play around your own rhythm you know and uh, they did that and that changed everything and I was able to like square everything out and then I hit this like this groove of being able to write in this very specific style which happened to be very similar to one of my favorite bands on the planet which is Lucero and it was and I won't even say that we sounded like him it was just in the ballpark. But man, we never got rid of that stigma. Not once. We also covered the mountain. We did, but that was early on. One of the few covers that we did. Yeah, and that was like that was the first And we show. nailed it. Like, I'm not going to lie. We nailed it. Oh, no, no. It was cover. killer. Like, damn straight, we nailed that. Like, I will say it out loud. We nailed that cover. Oh, you did? <laughs> so that's what was funny. That's how we, I mean, because mm-hmm. Huke had, I'd met Huke and he had a drummer. He quit and then he had hit Rick up in the past and was like, hey, dude. Still looking to play drums in a band. It's like, no, we got this other dude. And then it was like, but hey, you know, I think we ended up finding Randy and Nathan started playing mm-hmm. with us. I was like, hey, man, like we're looking for our first show and all this. And we just so happened to book our first show. But of course, didn't tell Rick that. Like, oh, yeah, you know, we could probably get y'all on a bill with us. I had no idea it was that was y'all's first show either. Yeah, I had that was no our idea. first show. That's, that's news to me. I think we had played, me, Randy, and Hugh did a three-piece, like, 25-minute set, I think, at Rudyard's opening for somebody. Mm-hmm. A friend of mine was like, do we just need someone to fill, like, 25 minutes? Yeah. We're like, we'll do it. So we did, like, <laughs> five songs. And then, uh, but yeah, that Corner Pub show was, like, the first one. Yeah. And it was I think great. we only went in there with four songs. I don't think we even had a full set. Like, we only went in there with, like, four songs. Yeah, it was something like that. Like, yeah. I think with the mountain, it was, like, five or minutes, six. Yeah. yeah. But it was good. Yeah, it was fun. I remember they got really mad at us because we were super loud oh it's because of the yeah the old the old, the old blue hairs that were in there right so like the owners <laughs> i think her dad had retired mm. from something so they decided to have their retirement party <laughs> at the, the right where the bands are playing Good call. and they were like Can y'all turn it down <laughs> you know what i did i immediately turned it up and they came they came up and they were like we're, we're gonna we're gonna unplug you if you don't turn it down and i was like okay 
<laughs> luckily, it was our last song. And luckily, by the time stage we, dive. we got up there, <laughs> they had already left. Yeah. They were like, let's go. Let's go to the Cracker Barrel where yeah. it's quieter. So I think they had left and yeah. gone somewhere else. Love the rocking chairs. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Gosh. Good times. That was that was a bit of that was a long time ago. I and mean, that's it was. That was I don't like, even I can't I don't even know what year that was now. Two, th- April twenty eighth, two thousand nine. That's, that's cause you made, that's because you made the flyer. Get that's out of only here. because that show was the day before my birthday. Uh, he also has a tattoo on his ankle. Don't let him know with this. Matt right. chat. <laughs> SP plus C L dot with the date. Oh, yeah. Oh, man. For man. life with a Y. In I life. just like I say, I just remember because it was this what it was the day before my birthday. So it was the twenty sixth before I turned 30. Yeah. So it was like the last day of 29 we played. I don't even think we had a, the name of the band until like a week before that. I think we were, because we were originally called Nobody's Darlings. And again, because of the whole Lucero thing, um, we decided against that. And, it's a good thing that you did that. Yeah. yeah. So that the name only came around because Joe Varner, our old bass player, the first bass player, he used to chew freaking grizzly <laughs> like tobacco. <laughs> oh man. Oh my god. I I have plenty of gross stories about that. But, oh the cup. Uh, but man, god, y'all hit I, the I never thought I was gonna fight a six foot seven man in my life. Ugh. So I want to say that was the same year we did like the big Fourth of July thing at Continental Club. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so I, I remember that. Cause I had to play some festival earlier that downtown, day. Downtown, yeah. And they're like, "Oh, we don't have any money. Here's a keg of beer." Yeah, and everybody was not in good shape. Yes, it was not in good shape. Well, that was a big deal in the be- in the beginning. None of us were ever in good shape. Like we gained that moniker of being the drunkest band, you know, in Houston easily because we were all too drunk to do anything half the time, and all of our pay would go towards our bar tab, like anything that we made was on our bar tab and we still owed 80 bucks a piece you know what i mean like we drank hard and fast like it it became an issue to the point where we were like all right guys we're only gonna have like mild alcohol abuse before a show and then you can do whatever the fuck you want after the show just as long as you're okay to go tomorrow you know like it was it was a big babysitting thing for all of us like you know i babysit myself what was your lead guitar player's name then Matthew. Matthew? Oh, no, you're talking about Brian. Brian. Yes, Brian. Like, that 4th of July show, Brian passed out over the top of the house drum kit at the Continental, and then somehow, like, woke him up, got him on stage, and the dude, like, played everything perfectly, (laughs) and then, like, had to be helped down the stairs. Mm Mm-hmm. It was kind of like the scene from, uh, what was it, The New Star is Born, where it's just like, yeah. just posted them up, and it's like, Mer! like just yep. played everything. Well, was it more like Weekend at Bernie's? And I'm not <laughs> talking shit about Rick, but Rick could do the same thing. He would come off the golf course to a show, and been out there since 10.30, tea time, and he's just blasted drunk, and he's like sleeping in the green room, and just like, I'm like, dude, you've got to get, he's like, man, I'm fine. I'm, I'm, I've got this. Eyes closed, passed out, drooling on the on the couch. And then it'd be time to go and be like, all right. And he'd sit up and he'd sit behind his drums and he'd just be like, and he would play absolutely perfect. Like without missing a beat, dead ass drunk, eyes closed, barely able to keep his head on his shoulders, but never missed a beat. Not once. Like Rick was like chef's kiss, like good drummer. Like he's the perfect country drummer, honestly. And function alcoholic. <laughs> oh, well, you know, aren't well, we all? <laughs> Except for you. You're actually just a functional human being. Barely. But then, <laughs> you know, through years and different pieces moving, because mm-hmm. Brian left and then... Matt came in. Yeah, Matt mm-hmm. came in and then... Uh, well, actually, there was an awkward moment there for a while before Brian left that Matt was there as well. That's right, you had well. two, we had, three. It was me playing guitar, it was Brian and then Matt, and Brian was real upset about it. But the thing about it is, Brian was initially just a rhythm guitar player and I was just also a rhythm guitar player he was just a marginally better guitar player than i was and then matt came in and was like you know burning chords and like he felt really inferior and i spent a lot of time not playing my guitar during that period of time because i didn't have to you know yeah and say the two cow show it was the three guitar mm -hmm. show yeah we opened for two cow garage it was one of the one of the few that we played with all three of us but we practiced quite a bit but most of that was just Matt learning the songs so that you know we could basically phase Brian out, but then Brian left pretty quickly. We that's a that's a story in of itself. But Brian Brian ended up leaving on his own accord, and you know there was no you know bad feelings, no bad blood or anything like that. But uh, he left as soon as uh, Rick left. He was like, "I told you, I'd leave if Rick left." It's like, "Okay, buddy." <laughs> but I've had a handful of drummers. I think I've had three full drummers. I had uh, after him was uh, Jason Coberly. Yeah, and then was it. 
I had more more than that. No, maybe it was just Jason Cobley and then Nathan. Once Nathan got in and we, Nathan stuck. Yeah, Jason yeah. came in after Jason. Or pff, Nathan came in after Jason. Yeah, because I want to say when I when I first saw you, it was a rare and sound for you at the mm-hmm. Southside Roller Derby. Yeah, Cobley was on Cobley drums. Was there, yeah. yeah, yeah. See, I don't even know if I met him. That I think that was when we had like Wait, we're just collapsed. Mm-hmm. Like it was just like, mm-hmm. and then I guess I didn't see y'all for a little bit. Maybe I don't know. Yeah, there was there was a space because we had to kind of like restructure and i I mean i I felt like for two years straight i was teaching drummers literally because you know i had i mean jason was only there maybe nine months and then by the time nathan came on it was like another six months of like getting him on board and then we went on tour immediately with him and (laughs) the first night we played with him first song was the first live show that we played with him was texas heat and (laughs) he gets into the song and he cuts the song in half like literally like we finish a, a chorus and then he just like and like the song ended because there's a hard break right there but it just ended and i turn around and i was like you got it bud and he was like yeah and i was like the song wasn't over and he was like oh yeah and then we just moved on to the next song and just kept going and he never missed a beat after that so <laughs> but it was that first first song jitters you know like you get it you know everybody gets it it happens yeah I mean, hell, even 500 songs. There's plenty of times I've turned to Kim after songs like, did I do the last verse? <laughs> oh, I don't never <laughs> Where I like, started watching someone in the audience, and then it's like, did I do the last verse? <laughs> What's even better is one night she's like, mm-hmm. yeah, 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 you, we did it. You didn't, like, I can end it. And okay, and then I went back, and it had been recorded, and I was like, I didn't do the last verse. <laughs> Kim was even like, yeah, 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 I was done. I was also <laughs> distracted by that chick in the audience. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> I, I I just I had a tendency to just to fully rely on muscle memory and – and that was it because when it came to singing, like I spent more time concentrating on singing than I did on playing guitar. So sometimes I would lose track of that and I would like, my hands would be like, I don't know what the next chord is. And that's the scary spot. Like I, I'm okay with once my brain clicks on to lyrics for the muscle memory, but whenever it came to playing guitar, if I lost muscle memory and I stopped playing, it was like, I'm completely lost now. Like I, I would like lose lyrics. I would lose everything. So I had to make sure that every once in a while, I would there was this very delicate balance, you know. And sometimes I would just step away and just have to turn around and be like, "No, guy, guys, no idea where I'm at. Just, just keep it going." I'd be like, "Do the round." Where I'm no idea where I'm at. <laughs> Big Ben Parliament. <laughs> yep, constantly, constantly. You know, Fucking man, hard. Elf can tell you that happens with us. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah. Where it's like, oh, fuck, that was not where that core went. Then the next core, like I said, it's like moving that, when you're typing and your hand moves over one button and you're like, oh, God, like, what, how did I just type all of that? And it's kind of what, like, oh, I think it's F right here. It's like, no, that wasn't it. And then you're like, well, it's this one next. <laughs> nope, nope, yeah, nope. Search, and then, searching for chords on stage is not the place to be. That's for sure. I don't know. All I got to say is that I don't think I would want to be a, a garage band coming up now, man. It was hard enough for us because I feel like I missed the boat. You know what I mean? Like, I really feel like uh, that I missed the boat with doing or, you know, getting getting the big tours, the warp tours and all that stuff. You know, like I was a day late and a dollar short. But and these kids now, I mean, they're just listening to a track at a time, you know, like, yeah. Be, be relevant a track at a time. That's tough. It was hard enough to write a whole album, much less write one song and be relevant. Well, that's something we talked about with Grifters and Chills. You know, the industry has changed. The consumer is more track driven, not album driven, Mm -hmm. which for, I guess, dinosaurs like us, Mm -hmm. we're like, but I want to do an album. I I think the idea of an album serves its purpose. You know, so I'm I'm hoping that eventually we kind of come back around to it, that kids start, you know, discovering their parents' albums like, man, that's kind of cool to have a, a, you know, start to finish this whole idea in 10 tracks. You know, I think we will get back there but right now it's it, it's that kind of that quick it's like it's like amazon you know yeah. you, you want it now because you can get it now yeah well you a know? lot of it's like history repeating itself i yeah. mean you know in the 50s and 60s that was it you recorded that one song one hit yeah. wonders yeah you put that shit you got it pressed immediately you mm-hmm. ran you know within hours of it being recorded you're running some dude down to the local station and like put this on now you yes. know right yeah. this second here's the 20 bucks with yeah. it just pop this on mm-hmm. and then they play it i mean you know it's the story like recording what's elvis when they did uh it's all right baby mm-hmm. you know hour after that it got played like eight times in, in a row on the radio right. because they did it like that mm-hmm. and then people started being like man i'd like to have more than just one song at a time yeah right i think eventually kids today will get burnt out on the singles and then be like well I, what i hope is going to happen is that like that one track is like your your calling card sure 
to invite someone in and listen to the whole album because right. I think yeah. there are still enough people out there who, once they digest a song that they like, they want to hear more by that person. Mm-hmm. So I hope that's what happens. I mean, that is adorable that you feel like that. <laughs> um, but I, I, <laughs> well, I think if we're big fans, it'll work that way. But I think it's always been. I mean, think no, about it, when you it, were a kid in the eighties and nineties, people still went and bought those cassette yeah, singles. Yeah, you're right. I mean, that's that's how it it should work, you know. But I think we've just come into this era where everybody is no longer like you're an artist as a whole, as this general sense. And I can come in and I can write a hip hop song, and then next week I'm going to do a country. song song and uh, you know if you time it just right you'll be fine you know they're gonna buy just as many of those tracks as they of each genre you know at least that's what i'm seeing you know and and depending on i guess which genre i mean that's still punk rock they they're still putting out albums you know but even still they've kind of adhered to like you know every you know every quarter every six months they're putting out a single you know what i mean like we're used to you only put a single out like just before you dropped an album you know what i mean like that was the only time you ever put out a single is is if you had an album planned you know coming up and like that like you said that was your calling card right you know that was the title track or your your main track you know that would be on the full album you know may not have been the first song but it was going to be the main song on it you know so you get your single and then you get your you know your lp you know and um i don't know i don't i would like to see us get back there but i don't know man I don't know. You know, most reason, I mean, I'll be honest, when I was a kid, the most reason I got to where I liked the entire album, mm-hmm. because I was too lazy to get, to get up, up and, and your- rewind that same <laughs> song every yeah. time. Yeah. And it would just That's be true. after a while, you're like, yeah. I mean, think about when you get like a compilation record, but you know the LP really well, yes. and you're like, the that next song ends, and you're like, oh, cool, this is about, and, and then something like, nope, else it's happens. it's like some random band. And you're yeah. like, what the hell yeah. is, like, I was ready for this, now yeah. I'm go find this song. Yeah. Well, I mean, I feel like that's how, you know, once people, you know, like, you get a record player, I mean, it's the same thing you know like you're not going to stop the record in the middle of a you know in the middle of the actual album to put it on a different i mean some people will do that and i call them assholes you're not going to fucking pick up the the needle just to put it on a different song on the same record it's only going to take you 18 minutes to 12 minutes to get through it just listen to the whole thing you dummy you know yeah and you know i mean that then you had like cds compact discs that came out and you could skip all over the place it was amazing you know like you could fast forward and there was that weird little digital noise that it made like I can't even I can't even replicate it. But, but the cool part about the CD though was you got the hidden track. Oh yeah, the hidden track was where, where the money was at. Yeah, like that was the good stuff. I actually found a hidden track that I didn't know I had on uh, what was it? It was uh, was it AFI's Black Sales? I think, and it's like 19 minutes at the end. I never even noticed. I just happened to like turn it on the other day, and at the end of it, and it was like basically the song that kind of prefaced the gray album and they were like oh yeah we're going in a completely different direction guys but we're gonna put this on the end of this (laughs) album and it's like this kind of like live studio version of it so it's not great compared to like the super polished version that they got on the next album but i didn't even know that that existed yeah but it it was it was 19 minutes after the album ended like dead air it was just dead air and then suddenly a song comes. i'm like sitting in there i'm like doing dishes i'm like what I was like, I don't have this album. I hate this album. And I go in there, and it's Black Sales with the first track on their following album that came out like four years later, you know? So <laughs> we'll see. And like, what was cool for me is one of a local band, Secret Agent 8, they had a hidden track on their first album. And what it was is when you record a ska band, apparently, when you do your, your scratch tracks, the horns have to sing their parts. Mm. And so it's it's one of their songs is it a requirement? Yeah, I, I don't know. But the, it was Dan Workman produced the album, so he may have made him do I th- it. I think Dan was just <clears throat> fucking with him. He might have been. But it's great because <laughs> they had to do all their horn parts. So you had two trombones, two trumpets, singing their parts, nice. all their solos, because it was an instrumental song. And so they're singing. And to hear them like have to mouth through their whole solo, mm. it's the funniest thing. You know what? I think next project is coming up, Steel City, okay? okay. I'll tell you what. When we go into the studio, bass player, drummer, mouthing everything, beatboxing, bass are going to be mouthing everything for the scratch tracks just for my vocals. I think it's just going to make it happen. Brilliant. Just going to make it happen. Did you come with the idea of Steel City? Is that is that the, is that the name mm-hmm. of the group? Yeah, I like that. Yeah, I, like I that. actually got it from uh, there was a uh, I I used to work out here in Baytown and uh, there's a Kroger, the Little Diddy Kroger. I can't even remember what street it is off of here. It's all like a park in Alexander. Yes, off of Alexander. And in the uh, parking lot, there was this little silver medallion that was like pressed into the the concrete and it just said Steel City on it. It was like hammered in with like a, you know, like a, and I was like, that's going to be the name of a band someday. 
It's just going to happen. All right, you heard it here first, folks. Yeah, that's going to happen. Steel we'll City, Steel City is definitely a project that's a <clears throat> that's a dream project that will that I hope will come to fruition someday. So, all right, well. On that note, man, thank you for coming. Hey, man, thanks. We'll leave it hanging, everyone hanging, thinking <laughs> right. about Steel City. <laughs> that seems like the proper thing that way, you know, one day in the future when Steel City happens with the acapella <laughs> instruments, yep. we'll come in and we'll have a good discussion about it. <laughs> right. Well, I appreciate y'all having me here. Oh, this man. Awesome, I man. totally begged him to let me be here. <laughs> <laughs> right. So it's fun. Thanks for coming. <laughs> yeah. I enjoy it. All right, everyone. Thank you for listening to another episode of Music in the Minor League. Again, if you like what you heard, please share the podcast with your friends. It's the best way for us to reach new listeners. If you enjoy listening to Chad talk, keep an eye out for Iron City coming down the way. And as always, follow them on all your social media platforms and all your streaming services of choice. Now we're going to leave you with one last song from Chad and Health's band, The Grizzly Band. This one's called Last Call Waltz. We'll see you next time. But I'm